gang. Thanks so much for tuning in to the second part of Lesson 3-3. This is Professor Jared Rathel, and in this installment, we're going to be thinking about the evolution of multicellularity. So this beautiful image that you see before you is a slime mold. Slime molds are composed of a multitude of eukaryotic cells. Slime molds used to be considered part of the kingdom fungi, but they've since been reclassified into the kingdom protista. So it's probably more appropriate to think about these guys as large numbers of amoebas that are working collectively as a single multicellular organism. So we're going to return to these cellular slime molds, organisms that can live both freely as single cells and then aggregate together to form multicellular reproductive structures. But first, I want to describe this really cool characteristic of the slime molds. So they lack brains, no nervous system, but slime molds are capable of solving mazes. They're capable of choosing the healthiest food from a diverse menu, and slime molds are even able to mimic the layout of man-made transportation networks. Mark is recreating an experiment he worked on with colleagues at Tokyo University. He takes a blob of slime mold and then surrounds it with a pattern of oat flakes, an irresistible treat to the slime mold. What happens next is recorded by a time-lapse camera. The slime mold locates the oat flakes by growing out in all directions. But within hours, the slime mold shrinks back leaving an intricate web of tubes that connect the oat flakes. It's these tubes that transfer nutrients around the slime mold. Incredibly, everything you can see is part of one single cell. It needs to build a network that's quite efficient to transport all those resources around. At the same time, that network mustn't cost too much. It right, mustn't take right. up too many yeah. of its own resources. And then the other problem it has is it, uh, it's going to be subject to damage. And so if there was only ever one connection, there's a risk that that would break. The slime mold takes no chances. It grows backup roots to make sure that its food supply isn't cut off. But there's something even more extraordinary about what the slime mold has done. Mark hasn't just laid out the flakes in a random pattern. The large blob in the middle is Tokyo. Right. And each of these food sources is positioned as one of the cities nearby Tokyo. So it's a, it's a recreation of the area around Tokyo. Indeed. So this is actually what it's based on. This is the rail network around Tokyo. And we can superimpose that over. OK, so we're in a line. That's identical. It's absolutely identical. So you see a lot of these connections, it's formed the same sort of links. It's got a few extra ones in as well. It's a slightly more resilient network than the ones that the engineers oh, designed. Oh, you, you, you're telling me, wait a minute, that this slime mold has built a b better network a remarkably than similar the humans network. built. <laughs> yes. Recall from our previous lecture that the surface area to volume ratio is what limits the size of cells more free oxygen in the atmosphere following the great oxygenation event allowed for the evolution of larger eukaryotic cells some 2.1 billion years ago. But this only allowed for the evolution of unicellular eukaryotes. How do we go from a unicellular eukaryote to a portobello mushroom? or a ponderosa pine. Becoming multicellular, like you see on the far right, allows for massive collections of cells to still maintain that high surface area to volume ratio and import oxygen and remove carbon dioxide by the physical process of diffusion a process that doesn't require energy. 
Now, eventually, life is going to evolve vascular systems, circulatory systems that are going to move gases and nutrients uh, to all of these cells in this multicellular body, but that's going to come later. The first multicellular organisms, and this uh, question shows up on your next assessment, were no more than colonies. They were collections of cells with no differentiation, meaning that all the cells are pretty much essentially the same. These cells don't have specialized functions yet. These colonies were just simple filamentous strings, balls, or sheets that shared cell walls bound together by connecting proteins. Okay, so this is a huge idea. Multicellularity does not just evolve once in the evolutionary history of life. Multicellularity evolves independently a number of times throughout the history of life within the protists. So in separate instances of convergent evolution, multicellularity evolves, giving rise to different lineages. Lineages like the uh, cellular slime molds, the brown algaes that you know as kelp, the green algaes or the carophytes that are going to evolve into the kingdom plantae, the kingdom fungi, as well as the kingdom animalia. So how did this process actually work? So the cellular slime molds are going to offer us a glimpse into how that process works. For part of the life cycle of the cellular slime mold, individual cells behave completely independently, doing their own thing. And then when food becomes scarce, they begin to cluster together, working cooperatively in these multicellular reproductive structures. So this video footage is a little old, but it is spectacular. A mix amoebae of the cellular slime mold, Dictostelium. When food is plentiful, the mix amoebae are completely independent as they feed and multiply. When their food supply dwindles, their behavior changes remarkably. When they become crowded, they start moving together from all directions, flowing into growing masses containing thousands of cells. Aggregation starts when one cell spontaneously secretes a pulse of a hormone called cyclic AMP. Nearby cells respond by moving towards the hormone and by emitting their own pulse. Soon this response becomes widespread and synchronized, creating waves of accelerated movement passing through the migrating cells. These mix amoebae are streaming steadily towards a distant aggregation center. As always, there are a few stragglers rushing to catch up. The aggregations of cells round up and then each turns into a slug called a pseudoplasmodium. These slugs are active, searching the terrain for a suitable place to settle and leaving a trail of slime as they go. Remember that each slug consists of thousands of free-living amoebae which now have organized themselves into a cohesive unit and which synchronize their activity. During its travels, an individual slug may fuse with other slugs it happens to encounter. Meanwhile, a few individual mix amoebae are still visible, moving around on the surface.
After this migratory activity, the slug rounds up again, but this time it flattens onto the surface and then grows a thin stalk with a fruiting body on the tip. Throughout these manoeuvres, the mix amoebae remain separate individuals. During this final phase of reproductive activity, the behaviour and fate of each cell continues to be subordinate to a self-generated pattern. The mix amoebae in different parts of the pseudoplasmodium differentiate into three main types of cells with different functions. Some cells form the base and others the stalk, while the rest migrate up the stalk and turn into spores in the fruiting body. The mature spores are later released. A similar process, like you've just observed in that video, occurred in the ancient evolutionary past and ultimately produces the kingdom fungi. So on the left-hand side, this is a phylogenetic tree of the eukaryotes, and you can see the kingdom fungi right here. And so this is at least one instance in which multicellularity evolves. The kingdom fungi are eukaryotic. They're multicellular heterotrophs. So they acquire their energy by um, absorbing food, uh, excreting molecules into their environment, and uh, absorbing their food. We see a similar pattern a progression from unicellular to multicellular in the lineage that begats the kingdom plantae. So on the left-hand side, the upper left, panel A, this is clammy domanus. So these guys live their entire lives operating as individuals. They're made up of single cell. This is a single-celled algae that lives its entire life independently. This is gonium and then pandorina here. These represent intermediate stages of algae. So they spend part of their life cycle as unicellular individuals and then part of their life cycle with their cell walls bound together by connecting proteins. By the time we get down here to the bottom right, panel F, this is volvox a true multicellular green algae. What's totally wild is that to go from clammy domanus, single-celled algae spending their entire lives independently, to multicellular volvox, there's only a few novel genes that distinguish volvox from clammy domanus. As we see again and again in evolutionary history, existing genes are just repurposed to give rise to new emergent properties like multicellularity. Let's return to that phylogenetic tree and we see yet another instance of multicellularity arising here. Uh, giving rise to the carophytes, the green algae that go on to colonize dry land and become the kingdom plantae. We're going to talk about that evolutionary event in our next lecture. But the kingdom plantae, multicellular, composed of eukaryotic cells, autotrophs, provide their own food through photosynthesis. And lastly, we have the coanoflagellates. This is a group of free-living, animal-like, unicellular protists with flagella that end up forming colonies. They work together, beating their flagella together to collect food. The coanoflagellates are considered to be the closest living relatives to the animals. The sponges, like this barrel sponge that you see on the top left on this beautiful coral reef, members of the phylum porifera, the sponges, are the first true multicellular animals. 
These very simplistic animals, they lack true tissues. Their cells are not specialized. The sponges evolved 660 to about 700 million years ago, and they represent a basal taxon, the first lineage to diverge from the kingdom Animalia. Sponges are comprised of these collar cells here uh, called coanocytes, which uh, are remarkably similar to coanoflagellates the free-living, unicellular, animal-like protists that form colonies. So essentially a sponge is just a collection of these coanoflagellates that are now beating their flagella together to pump water in and feed, bound by, permanently bounded uh, by this protein matrix into a multicellular animal. So we will discuss the rise of animal diversity in the final lecture in this unit. But again, I remind you here that multicellularity evolves independently numerous times, including in these three lineages, which give rise to the kingdom plantae, fungi, and animalia.